You have created a monster and it will destroy you. This is getting out of hand. Now there are two of them. Yukiro Taco Bell. I don't know what the heck's going on here, but someone needs to get their asses kicked. I'll be back. What's your favorite scary movie? This one looked at me. Take your stinking hands off me, you damn dirty human! You've got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? I am talking about the real possibility that he is still out there. You're listening to Unhinged with Kyriakos Vilches. I bow to you! Your sons and your grandsons will look into your eyes! And when they ask you why you fought so bravely at Galgamela, you will answer with all the strength of your great, great hearts! I was here this day at Galgamela for the freedom and glory of Greece! Welcome to Unhinged with Kyriakos Vilches. I'm yours truly back with, drum roll please, fanfare. Who is it? Sandeep C. Say hello, Sandeep. Oh. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> See, you learned you learned your lesson from last night. You're like, yes, I'm not going to get on on his on his bad side. No, no, no. It's well, I'm not worried about oh, the bad side. I'm worried about stepping over your beautiful intro. It's actually, yeah. It's 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 an intro. I don't. I, I wouldn't call it beautiful, but it's it's it gets me through the day, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's actually very nice to have like an ease to ease things, and I just yeah. So this is a more civilized, I think. Yeah, I did listen right. to some of your other podcasts, and I can see the difference. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Quality wise, uh, really quick. Again, to the folks at home who stomached my Batman and Robin commentary, <laughs> I apologize. And again, I don't know what happened. My and I'm and I, you know I'm bar- I'm embarrassed. I was using the studio mic that day too. It's the gain. The gain was fucked up on that. So. I apologize for that. If you guys got through it, I hope you enjoyed it. You know, me talking about Alfred for like 45 minutes. So, uh, so before we get started here today, well, Sandy, maybe I, I, I'd like you to tell everyone what we're talking about today. What movie we're oh. talking about? So today we're going to talk about a movie called Alexander, which was directed by Oliver Stone. And it was initially released in 2004 funny story is that that wasn't the only release so i'm gonna let you take it from there karyakis okay good 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 setup great a plus but however however we have a little bit of a court session today oh, so oh, before oh. we before we jump into the review and, and, and it's unfortunately i have to hold court on both you and i okay mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. there are some there were some faux pas Advice. There were small ones, really. There, there, uh, there, there, there were some. Uh, I wouldn't. Some of them were small. Others. Uh, it's not were, like I didn't. Know. It's not like it's not like I made three. I, I, I made more than three faux pas. I mean, oh, okay. You, do, you, do, you, do you do you want me to uh, l- <laughs> let me let me lay out your the charges against you? Okay. Uh, so, Miss Mister Mister, I think I'm not. I, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce your last name because I'm going to butcher it again. Um, right, Mr. <laughs> C, <laughs> excess <laughs> word of the use carica- the w- use of the word caricature, and I kid you not, you said it over twenty times <laughs> throughout yeah, the was like a five hour discussion. I mean, how you got to give me an hourly rate? Like how low? How many per hour was I saying? You I, okay? You said it at least ten times in less than about fifty minutes. Really? So I, I I I use that word in just one little because the thing was pretty long. Yeah. Now your your defense is it was relevant to the conversation. I don't find you guilty of that. I think that that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was okay. going to say my, my my final last ditch last ditch defense is it's a word that starts with C like my last name. 
Yeah, there you go. Okay. Like, uh, 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 <laughs> that that charge is dropped. That's it. You, I, I I have no I'm up the prosecution rests. I'm sorry. Okay. Next thing. Um I, I don't know how many variations of Bobcat Goldweight's name you know, but <laughs> there were several times when you called you called Bobcat Goldweight, you called him Bobcat Goes Weight and also bobcat goes away and i thought maybe bobcat goes away was appropriate because i don't think anyone wanted bobcat gold weight to begin with i plead not i, I plead guilty to that one no contest all right that that charge is i just can't pronounce his name I, I just can't pronounce his name i i also you also called johnny depp donnie depp and you you said it with you said it with gumption so i thought like does he actually think his name is donnie yeah, that was was that towards the beginning or towards the end? The the most again, I think I think you can you can take a plea on that one. The the last charge was that you said Luke was getting electrocuted by Vader's force lightning when it was oh. actually the Emperor. No, no, I, I yeah, yeah. I think yeah, military tribunal, firing squad. I I, I, I would think it's appropriate. Yeah, so I think two charges stick there. We're gonna we're gonna give you ten. We're gonna give you five years in Olog's Olog Oleg's Gulag. <laughs> now I'm not. Oh. See, I'm not. I'm not off the hook. I have char. I'm 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 self incriminating because I literally sounded like I was in the Phantom Zone with like a Mr. Potato Head voice like ninety percent of the episode. So I already got well. six years from that. It makes me wish that I had I, I had been in the Phantom Zone saying those things. The, 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 the Luke Skywalker one really gets me. It's like, yeah, I know it was the Emperor. I, I've seen Return of the Jedi like a million times. Um, I saw it, you know, in its initial release because I was on this earth at that point in history. Yeah. And yeah, I, I, I can't forgive myself for that. Donnie Depp, you know something? Johnny, Donnie, it just may have been a slip of the tongue. I don't feel that bad about that one. Yeah. The force lightning, yes. And, yeah, and Darth Vader never really was a force lightning user, right? Or, or, or did he actually know how to use it? Never, never. Oh, Interest, interesting that, I, and it makes sense because if, I think if he would have done it, he would have short circuited, right? His entire body is kind of predicated on using that suit to survive. Yeah, yeah. He wouldn't basically get it. Yeah. So, yeah, the agree, egregious crime. Yeah, but that's not even the worst <laughs> part. That's not even the worst part with me. Uh, I literally sounded like an old woman on like a mortgage refinancing commercial throughout the entire thing. <laughs> like I would like forget what I was saying three seconds before I'd forget. I'm like, I don't know what the fuck was going on with me anyway. So I, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. It was bad. It was bad. I, I, as one comment was from one of our uh, friends. Why do I even have to beat around the bush? It was goddamn old. Like he just said in like three words, you sound terrible. That was, that was it. That was his judgment on the entire episode. <laughs> oh, he listened to this. He, I, I, I'm, I can bet everything I have. He listened to it for less than three minutes and 26 seconds. I can, I can guarantee you it. I can't see him listening past four minutes on anything. Okay. Fair enough. Unless Fair it enough. involves, unless it involves Israel, Russia, or like some comedy show he wants me to go to that I don't show up at anyway. <laughs> nice. <laughs> or to convince, I'll, I'll leave it at that. So I think that um, there, so we we have laid bare our sins of the past uh, podcast that I was on. What is this one? So I mentioned that it's going to be about the movie Alexander, and that I'd mentioned that it was initially released in two thousand four. Yes. What? Yeah. What's the uh, addendum to that? What's the what's the lowdown on Alexander? Yeah. Okay, for for our folks at home who are familiar unfamiliar with this, uh, I'll I'll say fantastic movie. I don't know what you'll say about it <laughs> later. Um, <laughs> theatrical release. You're right. November two thousand four. Now this is a it's a tricky release right because we have like four versions of this movie we have the theatrical version 2004 we have the director's cut 2005 we have revisited the final cut 2007 that's my favorite of the bunch and then we have the ultimate cut which was released like seven years later in 2014 which is the one that you watched correct correct yeah yeah um initial release for the Revisit Final Cut. That was mine, uh, February two thousand seven. 
did it i couldn't find anything related to the ultimate cut um again sometime 2014 so like what seven years after the fact Raw and tomato score 65 percent audience score budget 155 million most of which was independently funded from what i from what my research showed box office compared to breaking even pretty bad 167.3 million so 167.3 million so all of us technically it was a box office flop mm -hmm. yeah um so this the disagreements around stone's vision uh just kind of to sum that up before we jump into all the the nitty-gritty details was that he wanted to improve on each edition or even some of the critics admitted reworking earlier installments or earlier versions of the film improved upon it so by the end some of them say that he created a much more epic movie than he had set out to make a lot of people argue that that's kind of what the proto Zack Snyder would do where it's like you just keep releasing things until it finally works where some directors don't even have that ability because they're limited by funding so that's kind of interesting and where the most of the criticism lies is that he provides us with a Shakespearean tale fixed and filled with a mixed bag of historical inaccuracies so that's uh something to ponder as we kind of go through the motions here well any well, thought any any that. any thoughts on any of that information yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I initially was looking at the theatrical cut. I I was vaguely aware of, of the reworks, but I thought that you know it was a it was a theatrical cut. And so I had watched that like a lot and made my initial notes based on that. And then I went to the to the ultimate cut. And I think you know it, it kind of shows um the evolution of ideas, you know, over time. But I think it also begs question, why we do it? You know, I mean, I would think, if, uh, if Snyder aside, I would think most directors are thinking, okay, you know, I want to get the best thing I can get out as soon as possible. I mean, you know, when you compare the theatrical cut to the ultimate cut, they're so different. Um, one is a vast improvement over the other in my mind. And it, did it, were there any production issues that came up um, during the, the initial um, production of this movie? Anything that may have negatively impacted it? You know, it's the uh, so I'll get into some of that at the very end, but offhand, I will say that because he was kind of in his own sandbox with his own funding, uh, he took. He didn't take any liberties, but he he bit. I think he bit off a lot more than he could chew, which is where I think that this would have worked as another form of storytelling. And I'll get into that later. Um. So to kind of jump into who who were the faces behind this movie? What who, what kind of people did <laughs> Oliver Stone <laughs> want to portray Alexander and his cohorts and all that and all that fun stuff? Right. Okay. So of course, you know. Direct, we're, we're being directed by Oliver Stone, best known for movies like JFK, W, World Trade Center. Uh, we have Colin Farrell as Alexander the Great. Interesting cast choice uh, for several reasons. We have Angelina Jolie as Queen Olympias, Alexander's mother. We have Val Kilmer as King Philip II. Anthony Hopkins as Ptolemy. Jared Leto as Hephaestion. Rosario Dawson as Roxana. Christopher Plummer as Aristotle, Raz Deegan as Darius, not too familiar with his work, uh, Ben Von Lerit. It sounds like I'm mocking his name, but that's me trying to pronounce it correctly as King Porus. And then we have Brian Blessed as an unnamed wrestling trainer, which I, I found was, you know, a little insulting. They couldn't even give him a name. <laughs> he could have been, yeah. Uh, so, Again, just kind of a, a general anecdotal point here. Stone's praised based off of this cast for kind of bringing to life the breadth of the atmosphere with some of these key players in Alexander's story um, and the people that Alexander surrounded himself with. So I get why he put a lot of these heavy hitters in the movie. Val Kilmer, Angelina Jolie, Jared Leto, um, 
Rosario Dawson by this time isn't as prolific as she is now. Um, yep. But everybody else, like Christopher Plummer, Brian Blessed, these oh, yeah. are all like some of them are theatrically trained. A lot of them have been in really big movies. So he didn't. Again, there's there's a lot of where the budget went to is that he had to get all these people. And then you have Anthony freaking Hopkins, and he's not going to cost. You know, he's going to cost a pretty penny too. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So let's 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 start our journey in Alexander. Let's let's start with Anthony Hopkins as Ptolemy. Mm -hmm. You know, we're starting with Al Alexander or just uh, figuratively. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, well, I guess both, right? Because he's he's kind of our purveyor of the events. You know, we 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 Stone approaches this movie kind of like a a super flashback sequence that never stops from beginning to end, right? But we always have Anthony Hopkins as kind of that constant presence throughout the movie. Uh, right. So we so we open with Alexander's. Uh, well, actually. Hopkins has told me narrating Alexander's death in Babylon 323 BC. So this this scene in particular, I mean, good good setup. I mean, it doesn't it didn't feel like they were chewing binding off more than they could chew in terms of giving us an easy intro. And I kind of liked starting with the death. What would you think of them starting with the death as opposed to, you know, chronologically? So, um, it it depends. My answer really depends on the version that, that I'm thinking of, and I'm gonna, for all for, for for all intents and purposes, I'm gonna go with the ultimate version, so the 2014 version, and sort of my my verdicts. Um, I thought it was a very good choice. After 10 years to work on it, <laughs> it was really good to start with the end, um, partly because we know how it ended. Right, um, Alexander the Great's a known historical figure. There are going to be, there are bound to be people who are very, who are familiar, especially you know, with his end. So that is a good place to start. Yeah, I I am in agreement with you. I think it was uh, a very a very good uh, soft intro to kind of the the ep I guess the epicness of his character to kind of start with his death, um, and then we jump right in to the Battle of Guagamela. And uh, for those unfamiliar with this, this was the second and final battle between Alexander and King Darius III. Um, so I want to kind of give you an opportunity to kind of give us a compare and contrast between the battle that was depicted here. Well, I, I'll, I'll kind of jump in with what I was see I saw in the, uh, the revisited cut, but and the real life version based off based off your research. If you can, if you don't have to go into the the nitty gritty, but um, really. It, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, or, or you or if you'd like to, you can, it's fine. I, I would love to. I think that for the ultimate cut, it was very well done for the most most part as a movie. You know, I think that there are a few things. One thing I really liked was that they said he actually labeled the different sections of the army, you know, left, center, right. Because knowing that this being able to distinguish that is actually very crucial to understand what um, Alexander's battle plan was. Right. And basically his battle plan was very simple. And, and you saw the movie and it's, it's portrayed exactly as it's written down in a lot of the sources where, um, you know, Alexander was, 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 was confronted with a problem. Um, Darius had more soldiers than he did uh, by a lot. Um, I wouldn't go with the um, estimates of antiquity. I'd go with the estimates on, on the Wikipedia page. Those are based on the story. But he was definitely out, outnumbered. And what that meant was that Darius's lines stretched past the ends of his line. And everyone's nightmare in, in, in warfare in general, and particularly in antiquity, was being outflanked. To have your enemy's ends overlap yours and surround the, end of the, the, the ends of your line, right? Because now you're fighting in three directions. No one wants that. So what Alexander did was he took his right flank and started extending it, right? And here's a bit of background that wasn't in the movie. It doesn't take away from the movie itself, but not being in the movie. But what Darius had done before, because he had, there had been two engagements, two large scale engagements against Alexander's army. The second one was involved, involved Darius himself. And so the Persians just going to learn a bit. So what Darius had did was he had ordered the battlefield, because he was waiting for him basically, to, to level the battlefield. To, to get rid of any obstruction, blocks, stones, shrubs, trees, everything, make it level, to allow the use of three things. Um, 
cavalry, uh, chariots, and there are side chariots. So the chariots with like these big, huge swords, blades attached to their, to their wheels that would cut any infantry alongside of them. Right? And the third thing would be elephants. There weren't many elephants there. I think the number was somewhere between 15 and 20, but um, there were some elephants. So he, he had he had sort of, you know, um, really dressed up the place to his advantage. But obviously he couldn't get the whole space um, dressed up. And so as Alexander started moving his, um, moving moving his left, I sorry, his right of uh, uh, flank out to cover his his exposed end. As you see in the movie, Darius orders this uh, to say, so you know what, follow him. Don't let him outflank us now, right? What forced Basis' hand to finally involve and contact Alexander's right um, flank was the fact that Alexander had gone so far out that he was going to the part of the battlefield that Darius wasn't able to fix up and manipulate to the advantage of his army. So he was forced to attack. And so they were stretched so thin, it exposed that gap um, in, 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 in the Persian left and it exposed that, that is basically. And so as Alexander, when Alexander sees this and he realizes he's approaching, you know, sort of this, this broken part of the battlefield that wasn't fixed up, it was his moment to turn the wheel about and charge. The other thing about that I really liked was, as he turned about and charged, part of the Macedonian cavalry engaged the Persian cavalry on this now extended wing. He also included the light infantry, and that was key. I think that you know, the the what Alexander's army was very good at, amongst many things, was sort of combining different elements of the army very very deftly. And this is one example. He also showed another example in the center of the center of um, uh, in, the, in the center section of the army and the left is actually the left it's parmenio's left in the movie where light skirmishers come rushing out from within the ranks of the macedonian phalanx i thought that was brilliant i think the you know in, in all cases the kit that the men were wearing the weapons were for the most part more or less correct there were definitely some technical things so for example um, you know, when you think of a knight, a, a, a man on horseback with a lance, we tend to think of knights. And so it's a guy, you know, has sort of having a lance tucked under his arm and smashing into the enemy. It most likely didn't work that way with the Macedonians. In fact, it didn't work that way for most of uh, cavalry history, including heavy, heavy cavalry. Um, the Macedonian lance was this long thing, very comparable to Sarissa, which is the huge pike that the infantry carried. But it was very wobbly. And, and the point of the Macedonian lance, cavalry lance, was to stick an opponent, pull it out quickly, and move on to the next one. Hence the wobble. It made it easier to pull the pull, pull the other point out. So you weren't what you weren't you weren't really um, using the lance as an impact weapon, but it's this quick thrust killing weapon, right? So I did see some of these guys with their with the lances tucked underneath their arms, which um, is definitely not correct. Right, um, it wouldn't have happened that way. Um, I do know from later antiquity, you'll, you'll have, um, and this is actually Persian um, heavy cavalry, and then the Romans mirrored this, and you had sort of a two arm grip. Now, I don't know that they used this two arm grip um, in Alexander's companion cavalry, but it's one possible because you have more control of the direction you aim, and you could stick it in and pull it out with two arms, I imagine, would be much faster. Um, so there was one sort of little inaccuracy, but again, it doesn't take away from the basic um, basic plan of the battle. Um, the dust was a fantastic touch. I thought, you know, the, the, the confusion of battle was really nice. I think that they wouldn't capture that very well. Um, another thing we can discuss, you know, there's one, there's one more thing I actually do want to pick on, <laughs> um, but I think overall the, the scene was done very well. Um, there's one other sort of technical detail that I want to pick on, but I want to I want to hear your sort of impressions of this before we do anything um, further. So, in general, uh, watching the battle unfold, um, you, I'm always keeping in mind that we're basing our knowledge on how the battle transpired based off of whatever sources the historian has provided stone and relayed that to the cast and crew and the individuals who were in charge of training Colin Farrell and a lot of these cast people to kind of jump into their roles as 
uh, these Macedonians. Um, so you got into more of the finer details of the battle itself. I was more kind of awestruck with the presentation of it in terms of showcasing just how an ancient battle would kind of happen in this type of environment. Um, and there were some, you know, some directorial tricks that Stone kind of incorporated into the scene itself to kind of give you more of a, I, I would say, if you've ever played the game Risk, there's a there's a, a, ver a very intimate view of the battle that you wouldn't get, I think, with another director who would probably do a lot more close-ups than this huge, sprawling scale of watching formations move across the field as if you're playing an RTS game. And that's what it reminded me of. And I think he was really clever in using the Falcon, which is kind of a centerpiece throughout yeah. the movie, as kind of the bird's eye view, kind of giving us a good idea of the scope of the battle and then using a lot of practical effects. So you see a lot of blood, you see a lot of dismemberment, you see a lot, yes, of, yep. a lot, of, a lot of brutality where it probably worked today. If they did it CGI, it wouldn't look nearly as good. It wouldn't look yeah. nearly as good and wouldn't look nearly as believable. And he really wanted people in this environment to kind of feel what it kind of what it would kind of feel like to feel desperation and anxiety and terror when you see people getting their limbs hacked off. Obviously, none of this is actually happening, but it looks so damn good with some of the, the practical effect and makeup work that you really see the brutality of ancient warfare that rivals even movies like Saving Private Ryan by Spielberg and uh maybe fury um so i like that and i also liked how he was very keen as kind of you described on showing alexander's strategy of kind of doing that shoelace loop around the persian army and kind of showing how he initially goes about the kind of the, the roundabout fighting i mean you see a little bit at, at the very minor level in like movies like the lord of the rings when aragorn is kind of leading that charge on mordor and he's kind of you're seeing this it, it's very, very, very minimal and very kind of surface level. He does it on a more precise kind of picking apart at the bones way. Even if, uh, as you said, he doesn't, not everything is going to hit the historical mark, but I, I like that he did well, that. that. No, that definitely did hit the historical mark. But, you know, it's funny you bring up the Lord of the Rings because this idea of showing um, units in formation, the Lord of the Rings did do that a bit. It, it was a bit there, right? Um, I, this is what you the three, the three movies, even the Hobbit movie, like the Battle of Five Armies. You do sort of see units yeah. um, forming in different groups of combatants, right? But I, what I really wanted to bring up was a movie that came before this, and that was Gladiator. And I know, oh, I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that opening battle scene, in fact, I think Ridley Scott did an absolutely excellent, superb job, and I still think that. Um, of depicting sort of a battle scene in that particular movie and there he does go to go through the great pains of showing battle lines and sort of different cores of infantry moving forward you know? is, is is that is that is that the one where commodus is or is he he's part of the battle or is it just the general uh russell crowe's character and they're they're fighting the britons i think they're somewhere north right they're fighting the germanic tribes oh okay yeah, and, and what ends up happening in that one is that uh, you had the main line of um, uh, of Roman infantry engaging the, the, the Romans, and uh, Russell Crowe's character Maximus, he basically sets up an ambush with cavalry in the woods, and the oh, cavalry yeah. comes screaming out of the woods and snatches the rear of the uh, German the, the Germanic tribes from their 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 formation. Yeah. Um, but, is this yeah. is this also the one where they they used a lot of archery shots too? I remember there was a lot of like. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so that's what I liked about Stone too is that he he showed just how um, not only devastating an archery attack could be, but how somebody could navigate around it with with the with the like the the human fallibility formula in there too, where it's like not everybody's gonna get in the right formation to deflect a lot of these arrow shots. And I liked how there were some people who kind of followed the regiment of Alexander's directions to the T and other people who kind of slipped up and they were kind of the unfortunate victims of the Persians because of it. So it was kind of like, you see the, you see the intricacies of, did, did you, did of you ancient think warfare. I felt that the formations were, you know, sorry, go ahead. you thought they were what? I thought the formations were a bit too tidy. I, I mean, I give it a pass because it is, you know, 
drama on the battlefield movies off obviously going to be much more different than drama in real life on the battlefield. You don't even have time to <laughs> have that heroic moment or unheroic moment where something big is happening and people notice it. We have to keep that in mind. We're there's yeah. a microscope on everybody in this scene. In real life, like somebody could be doing the most heroic thing next to you in the battlefield and nobody would know about it. Yes. So I think for the sake of like storytelling, that's where I'm at. Um, wow. So the I can forgive the tidiness because there is no, I mean, if you, if it had it been a video game, and I think that that would be probably more appropriate where uh, the less tidy, the more fun it would be mm -hmm. and the more believable. But I think for a movie, you have to kind of take you got to cut a few corners to just to bring it yeah. that final product to the screen, you know. I, I, I do want to point out that historically speaking, that the tightness, the cohesion of the masculine phalanx is actually crucial to its action. Um, there was a battle, I believe it's Pydna, where the Romans defeated a Macedonian phalanx because the ground was uneven, because the formations broke up and were a bit loose. So I just want to point that out that. Um, Unlike other formations, um, where discipline is obviously useful and important, um, it was especially important for um, the Macedonians that really not staying in formation could have very, very bad results. So, um, you know, but I didn't see that many Macedonians falling to anything other than arrows. Yeah, uh, and, uh, on that initial attack? Yeah, yeah. Because... You know, the Macedonians are marching forward and Darius orders his archers to shoot, right? And at least in one section, because the center section, I believe, so that was Parmenian, that was on the left. And I believe, by the way, here's another, I believe it's inaccuracy. Um, Parmenian actually had cavalry, <laughs> at least according to some sources. But anyway, that, that's that's really an aside. But yeah, in, 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 on the left, that's where they sort of start seeing the archers coming as they're marching forward. And you know you start seeing some archers, you know, some some of the arrows come down, and I think that was great. I agree with you on that one. And some of those guys got some some of the Macedonian infantry actually did get hit by hit by arrows. The thing was that what what you saw, and I think I maybe I'm recalling this thing correctly, the way that formation worked, the first two or three ranks would have their 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 pikes, their their sarissas is the term they used, which is forward towards the forward towards the enemy. The ranks behind them, and they could be up to three to uh, three to five ranks behind them, perhaps even more up to six. They would have their pikes at an angle, kind of forming a bit of an umbrella over the ranks in front of them, right? And those ranks sometimes they would they, they would be able to sort of swish their sources back and forth to sort of deflect arrow fire. So I didn't see that, and that would have been really cool to see. So I did see, I did see, you know, guys getting killed by archers, which may have been preventable, but it's fine. But I'm wondering which Macedonian got killed in the initial contact, um, not by arrow fire. So when they were, because you did see a few limbs get hacked off. Oh, oh, so, okay, let me pause for a moment. Uh, give me thirty. Give me thirty seconds. I have to run downstairs and grab something for my dog. Uh, you t you t you tell a Macedonian related story in thirty seconds. I'll be right back. <laughs> uh, well, so basically, I think I'm gonna... yeah, yeah, no, 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 no dead air. Just go, just go. I'm just gonna carry forward the thought, basically, because I think yeah, go ahead. the other place where I saw that there were Macedonian casualties that were not inflicted by arrow fire was the center. And that's where you saw the side of the chariots. And I think that's what you may have been referring to. So what happened was as the side chariots, you know, there were these chariots with these big blades on their wheels that would cut infantry down essentially. And what Alexander Trina's army did do was as the chariots neared their lines, they would actually step aside wide enough to let the chariot pass through their lines. And as the chariot passed, and they would attack them. Uh, particularly the skirmishers. Um, you know, Macedonian phalanx, like I pointed out before, had to have some unique cohesion. So you couldn't have the infantrymen um, uh, jumping out of formation to attack the chariots. But the light skirmishers could. They had these this lighter shield. They could carry slings, for example. A uh, um, uh, uh, figure very much in the battle scene that was fantastic because it's an un sort of recognized and unsung projectile weapon. It's very effective. It's used very often throughout antiquity up until the Roman period. 
um, and also they would carry javelin slings. Um, sometimes, sometimes they would engage in archery, javelins. You know, so they basically and then they would carry daggers, axes. You know, small, sharp things, and they would most likely they're going to attack the uh, passing chariots. So um, that's I think this is what uh, Kyriakos was actually thinking about with hacklings, because as these in the movie, as the side chariots came about, the men stepped aside. Let them through, and some guys didn't quite step aside far enough, and they predictably get predictably get slashed in to pieces by these uh, side chariots. So I have returned, and I caught the tail end of that. That is exactly oh. yeah, that's what I was referring to. Um, chariot chariot play, as I call it. They really showed the devastation caused by the spikes on the, you know some some of the the, the chariot formations attacking Alexander's army. Um, so we get we get a few close up shots of that, and we also get I I I feel like there were hacking limbs moments throughout this oh, battle. Oh, oh, once they get into melee combat, yeah, you definitely had hacking limbs. There. Yeah, but and again, so this is, yeah, but, but again, keeping in line with what you were saying, it's um, it's these close up kind of microscopic moments that we get just to kind of show the drama on the field. Yeah, um, I think there's a big moment with Parmenion, and he's like the uh, at the at the very end. It's like, oh, the Alexander, you have a choice whether to chase Darius or help your army. Um, and it was funny, his, his son. Yeah, yeah. Parmenion was getting hammered to the left. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, that's, that's right, that's right. And he sends a writer, he sends his son out, and say, hey, listen. Okay, here I actually take issue with that scene. Um, I don't know if you want to complain about the battle more. I could do that, but since you put the you sort of put uh, let's just work on it. I take issue with that scene actually. Okay. When Lewis comes riding and saying, Hey, Alexander, Parmenian needs your help. And I take issue with that scene because when you watch it, it looks like Alexander is weighing in his head. Do I go after Darius or do I help Parmenian? So I you don't think that does that does that uh, is that in disingenuous to his character? Absolutely, I think it is. I've seen that based on sources, and I'm talking about Arian and Plutarch for the most part. And I probably should introduce who those guys are, but we can do that later. Um, for those of you who know, Arian wrote um, the Anabasis of Alexander, which is basically a uh, a, a, a compilation of, of, of his uh, battles and um, you know of his life, basically. And then Plutarch also. Wrote as well and um in both yeah in both of those it seems to me that his character was in fact the description was given was that there was no real hesitation alexander was very much like okay probably you tell that's what i'm going to go do i can get darius later and it is i think in a lot of cases much more in the line of his character he was a superb battlefield commander and i think as a superb battlefield commander one of the things you need to do is you need to your men need to feel valued by you Right. Mm -hmm. It's a lot like being being a manager of a company where you know you want your workers to work, you, they have to feel valued working for you. They have to feel like they can confide in, they can, you know, all these things. You basically there's a bit of psychological um uh, 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 counseling that you need to do as a leader. And I think that that Alexander, especially at that stage, of second guessing what I think what it, what the right thing to do would help Parmenian. It wouldn't have happened that way, and I think that he's overstating um, Alexander's ambition in this particular. Um, okay. The other thing I want to point out, and I'll let you, I'll let you go, is that again in battle, he, his his judgment tends to be very sound. It's mm -hmm. it, the, the problems in his judgment come up when he's not on the battlefield. The battlefield is a place where Alexander thrives, and he does everything, like literally everything, right. There's nothing he does wrong. Even when he does something wrong, so there's one scene in the in, 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 in the battle um, uh, where just, oh, sorry the Gavamella where two things happen. One, he gets stabbed in the thigh. That was actually that actually happened to him in the battle of Isis. The second engagement, large scale engagement, he took he fought with the Persians. Him being unhorsed actually happened in the very first large scale engagement with the Persians. But in each of those cases, despite the obvious mistakes he made. Um, he really um, sort of um, availed himself as a really superb commander in this case, and his decisions fundamentally ended up being correct. So mm -hmm. I'll leave it. 
before we proceed, um, I, I don't know exactly when to start, but there's a little bit of feedback coming on your coming out on your end. Um, it could be um, maybe the speaker. I, I don't know what it is. I have ear flexes. Maybe I'm also walking around and pacing. That's to be the problem. Okay, so that might be that might be it. So you're 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 coming in clear. I think it's because of the movement. Gotcha. Yeah. And now it's not moving. <laughs> I think that's uh... <laughs> so it's, it's, it's. I was wondering. It's like is Sandeep also leading a charge against Darius right now? What's going on? Well, it helps me think when I when I when I simulate charges. You know, charge. Yeah. <laughs> but in any event, I, I I did find you know to sum up um, if the feedback sort of obscured anything that I was saying. I, I do I, I I do think that um Alexander um second guessing or, or, or thinking about what to do, thinking about helping Parmenian was not something that he would have done. Mm -hmm. It would have been very clear to him. To so he's like he'd be hundred percent help the companions, we'll worry about Darius later. That's what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um I think for yeah, you know what? I I think I'll I'll have to I'll concede that point to you because if Stone wanted to kind of keep up with the grandeur of what people thought in terms of Alexander's stature as as a person, uh, it'd be much more endearing to say, hey, you know, he's willing to forego the battle immediately for the sake of helping his compatriots than uh, weighing it and losing precious moments where his entire you know columns could collapse. Uh, mm -hmm. And he could lose a good chunk of his men, but uh, and the battle, the battle could yeah. have turned too, if if you know. Um, so this was a very important decision. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's 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 kind of move on from Gagamela, unless there's something else you wanted to add about the battle. Well, there's plenty I want to add, but I think we we need to move on. <laughs> yeah, uh, we're gonna jump into Alexander and Olympias because we get to meet Alexander's mama. <laughs> mm. Mm -hmm. is yeah, it's played by angelina jolie i i want to ask are there any i don't like as to be honest with you the most of what i read about alexander i did when i was a teenager because i i really became kind of obsessed with him during that time and i read most. i think like two biographies <laughs> maybe watched a few doc documentaries i don't remember anything about them being like subtext of incest between them is that something created for the movie or was that something that existed maybe i'm not remembering i i i i'm pretty sure the incest thing never happened yeah i, I i'm pretty sure it, 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 to me the incest and, and quite a few things in this movie um the incest that with with Olympus in, in particular the incest things is about as believable as um and angelina jolie's accent yeah yeah, well, I, we can we can dissect that right now. I mean, just just as a, an opener to the folks, because I can't tell if she's going for Transylvanian, Russian, uh, Proto Greek. It's it's very strange. At times, it sounds like it's passable. Other times, it sounds horrid. And but most of the time, it just sounds like she's pretending to pretend. Is this? It's so bizarre. But her her acting yeah. is fine. Her acting's fine. It's just. The accent kind of takes you out of it. Yeah. Oh no, I agree. I, I there was a first like, what is going on here? It, it's almost like you know. So so the thing about Olympus is she's sort of cast as this sort of occult figure, right? Mm -hmm. um, she was sort of important in the uh, Order of Dionysus, um, um, at least locally, if not in a larger level, but definitely locally, and sort of heading up the order and you know um, overseeing the. Uh, uh, their feasts and things like that and the rites and everything so she had she played a big role in that that's sort of, that sort of thing um but this idea of this sort of occult priestess and i think maybe that's where transylvanian when you said transylvanian that's where it comes to my head like oh yeah she has this occult power she's kind of this witchy kind of lady and this and that um i don't know how true that was but it's true that philip and olympus never got along um, I don't think that that necessarily did their their discord necessarily drove Olympias to invest so much into her son as to commit incest either, right? And, um, and so the, oh no, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, it, it's I I don't want to I don't want to rag on Stone too much about it or that it is warranted. He, he it's 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 like uh there at times it's subtle, other times there's a moment uh later on in the movie where it's yeah. it's like outright like you know what is going on here um it's but there's like this subtext and this kind of weird chemistry between them and i think 
the the fault lies in him as in casting Colin Farrell and Angelina Jolie together as mother and son because I think Angelina Jolie was only a year younger than Colin Farrell at the time of this movie. So keep that in mind. She's younger than him, <laughs> and she's playing his mother, who's supposed to be like twenty years older. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So, so it may have come across that way, but I think that you know there are a lot of things about. Um, I'm going to expand the conversation just a tweak. A lot about his parents is definitely misportrayed. I don't think that there there is definitely tension between the three. Okay, they, mm -hmm. they, they don't they don't get along famously by any means. But I do think that there's a lot of liberties Oliver Stone takes. Now the incestuous thing, I kind of when I saw it, I and I know the scenes you're talking about, I brushed it off and didn't really think twice about it. But given the other things that he kind of plays up, which are factually untrue, at least as far as I'm concerned. I wouldn't put it past him to have sort of said, oh, maybe there's some incest, incest in here too. You know, so with everything else going on between these three. You know, um, and then again, this, this sort of push that, you know, Al, uh, Angela Jolie and her character would be as was this occult, weird, you know, um, woman to a certain sense she was, but there's one scene where like, she's with Alexander's young boy and she exposes him to snakes. And I, I'm assuming it's a poisonous or you know you know a uh, 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 deadly snakes i am not sure that that would have happened <laughs> i mean what do you think about that i just think it's just bad parenting if you do that <laughs> it's it's bad parenting i mean unless you're going by like uh crocodile hunter standards and i guess it's a plus parenting <laughs> introduce them early to the reptiles uh i i think i think again it's more of uh, stone incorporating art into history um in in term in re regarding Olympias in general, I mean, this kind of is a good segue into how he depicts Alexander's relationship with King Philip as well. Um, like the strain, tension. I mean, whereas his mother is pushing him towards his destiny, his father's holding him back. Is there is there more truth to the latter, where King Philip was trying to hold Alexander back for him, his birthright? Is it because, I mean, because he mentioned several times throughout the movie that he's never going to be seen as legitimate to the throne of Macedon and, and to, to, you know, to be destined to take over Greece and to unite the Greek city states. It's because his mother isn't exactly what ethnically Macedonian that she was. No, she's not. She, she's from Epirus, which is sort of the, the northwestern corner of Greece. Yeah. You know. Greece, yeah. So, I mean, is there is there more truth to that matter where King Philip did? Put Alexander lower than he should have in terms of his relationship with his son. I don't think so. I think there's always the lingering fear that he did. Mm -hmm. So you have to remember, Olympias wasn't his only wife, and now they did they did sort of highlight a marriage to to Cleopatra, which was a, a I think the daughter of Atlas, and Atlas was his uncle or something. So these guys were these guys. If you know anything about the uh, Ptolemaic dynasty, Anthony Hopkins was. General Ptolemy, he's a founder of this dynasty. They were very yeah. incestuous. There's quite a bit of incest going on fairly in the Macedonian dynasty. Um, but I think I think that you know the, the fear more was a matter of okay, um who is actually next in line? So aside from the Cleopatra and Atlas bit, um Philip used marriage to solidify a lot of his diplomatic arrangements. So he was the man who united Greece. He conquered or through diplomacy um, brought into Macedonian orbit, or, orbit most of modern day Greece. The exception being uh, Lacedemia, which is basically, uh, or Lacedemia, I can't, I'm not pronouncing it properly. You can ding in that next time. Um, but basically, Sparta. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that, that, that southern part of the Peloponnese, Sparta was the only state that did not fall under um, a, 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 a Macedonian control. And in fact, when Alexander does cross the Bosphorus to take on the Persians, it was still unfinished business. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you had, had more to add. <laughs> no, no. Uh, okay. um, yeah. So it's still, it's still, no, I think that, I think that was, that was uh, as far as I wanted to go. Let me see. Oh, I think I lost, I think I lost a bit of my train of thought. Uh, I hate when that happens. <laughs> you were, um, you were thinking, you were thinking of the trumped up charges coming. You're like, oh shit. Well, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. See, that's what, yeah. So, so, so the idea was that Philip used marriage as a, as a form of diplomacy. And yeah. so that really opened up a lot of questions about succession. And I think it raised a lot of um, paranoia 
Uh, paranoia is, is, is the wrong word because it, it definitely is something to worry about if you're if you happen to be a queen, mm-hmm. um, one of a few, right? And, and the question must have lingered very much in in, in, in Olympias's mind that is my son going to get his due? And I think it's a fair thing to be worried about. It's something which, as Alexander came of age, he may himself have started to worry about, okay. right? Because and of I, all these marriages, and yeah. No, and, and I think that's and I think that's reasonable. I think ascension to the throne is never guaranteed in antiquity. Certainly wasn't guaranteed in modern times. Uh, you always had competition. You always thought about sibling rivalries. You think about intermarriage between royal families. Um, yep. So it's it's always kind of a, a, a shadowy threat on your destiny. So that so I, I okay. So that that's a fair. So I, I don't I don't think there was a matter of Philip wanting to hold his son back. I I, I have a feeling that you know. Especially that scene with his horse when he first tames Bucephalus. Bucephalus his horse, yeah. right? Um, I mean, I don't know. You know, um, I, I, I think Philip was probably very, very intelligent and um, a, a discriminating individual, and he must have seen the greatness in this boy to have figured this out. He was very young when he tamed his horse, a horse that none of the adults around him was, were able to tame, and he did this. I don't really think it's a matter of Philip holding him back. I think it's it's a symptom of sort of, you know, again, how you approach diplomacy. And so there was none of that. Now, um, clearly, Olympias did want to bring him up, and she would always remind him, you're the son of Zeus, your ancestors were Achilles, and Hercules, sorry, Hercules, and this and that. Da, da, da. Um, but I don't think that Philip would have been actively undermining Alexander in in, in the sense of his development as a military commander and as a possible heir to throne. Yeah. Fair. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Um so but what, at the same time, Philip, he was a drunk, but his behavior when he's drunk, I did not think was portrayed correctly at all. Well we'll get to we'll get to that scene okay. where we're we're coming okay. we're coming up on that. We're gonna start we're gonna start uh the film direction takes the uh the flashback mm-hmm. approach pretty quickly soon so we'll get into that the um i did want to ask about the bucephalus as maybe a metaphor for alexander's character in terms of taming something that's untamable do you think that uh it would have been right maybe to also include the gordian knot somewhere because i don't think they show that at all and that's probably one of the most apocryphal stories or best w- most well-known apocryphal tales concerning alexander was that you know obviously he cut that knot that was untieable and you said doesn't matter how you do as long as you do it uh they didn't show that and i kind of wish that they did you think that would have been a moment i mean did, he did that later in his life though right maybe no no that was very early in this campaign just but it was before the battle of isis so there's again three battles of granicus which is the very first engagement he basically crossed the bosphorus and what the first thing he did was he, was, he met he was confronted with the persian army Isis was the second one, but between between um, uh, and Granicus and Isis, I don't know how much time elapsed, but it was quite a bit. Unfortunately, I never mapped out the time periods um, when I was looking into this stuff, but definitely those two battles occurred quite a bit space and time, so much so that Alexander had actually um, gone, uh, yeah, quite a bit of time elapsed between those two battles. Um, so it, it was early on in, in his campaigns. Thank you. Do you do you think the Gordian knot would have been a good uh, cinematic moment? Oh, I think of... cinematic would have been great. Yeah, I mean, think about what, how the scene could be set. I mean, you could have like you know, could have this intricate knot, and the camera could pan this knot, and the, the viewer could see just how crazy and insane. Am I am I giving you feedback yet or not? You're you're fine as long as you kind of limit the movement. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We're crazy and insane this not is it, 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 it i think it could have built up things a lot right just visually mm-hmm. you know, if you sort of you know like i said have the camera sort of um zoom in on the knot and people can see how crazy this knot was and this and that the other thing is there's two ways that alexander solved the puzzle right now going back to gagamela and 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 and, and when Philodus goes to um alexander saying hey my father parmenian's in trouble now, I didn't like that scene. However, there is this idea of Alexander the impetuous versus Alexander the very, very uh, uh, reserved and, and very calculating and very pragmatic, right? That 
was on the battlefield. The Gorshina was not on the battlefield, right? And here's where you have two interpretations or two storytellings, rather, interpreted, two tellings of what he did. One telling was he got so frustrated because he couldn't untie it. He pulls out his sword and he chops the knot. And he says, ha, I solved it, right? That's one version. That's the impetuous version. That's this guy who's constantly reaching for greatness, who just demands and expects it. He's that good. The other telling, I believe Arian tells this one, what he does is he looks at the knot, examines it very closely. And of course, the, the ropes, they're, they're fastened to this yoke. And there are these two dowels at the end of the ropes, at, at, at either end of the rope. And he just, he just undoes the dowel. And the knot falls apart. So using yeah. the using his intelligence, and he has a lot of intelligence. I mean, again, describing what he did in Galgamela, that takes incredible amount of intelligence, foresight, and he had all of these skills. And to me, the question becomes, you know, which Alexander are we talking about? Are we talking about the impetuous one or the really calculating one? I like the calculating story partly because when this occurs, um, the gorge and knot could be seen interpret in, in, in Alexander's character in one of two ways. As a symptom is megalomania, that, you know, I am this great world conqueror. I expect it. I deserve it. And I'm going to do this. That's hence chopping the knot, right? The other thing is calculating. And he, he what he does is when he goes to goes to, uh, goes to the Gorgian Knot, that this site, it's in uh, northern Anatolia, northwestern, I believe. Um, when he goes up there, he actually takes a bit of a U-turn. At least some people describe it as a U-turn. I don't think it was, but you know, enough people say that it was a bit of a U-turn. It's this weird thing. They use that to sort of justify his his uh, glory seeking. Let's call it that, right? Um, however, in succeeding untying, whether he chops it off or you know un 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 loosens it from the sides, um, it sends a message to the locals living there. You know, you grow up with these myths about, you know, stories, you know, and uh, and you grow up with the story. Oh, you know, there's just not somewhere in this, if this guy does it, he'll conquer all of Asia. By doing this one act, he takes care of a lot of enemies that may have arisen in rebellion <laughs> by legitimizing, legitimizing his rule, right? So everyone would say, oh, well, he untied the knot. And let's say he did it by releasing the ends of it, right? Well, then he's a rightful ruler. He has this sort of divine right to rule, right? Um, so there's sort of these two dimensions of the Gorgian knot, the, the impetuous Alexander and the studied Alexander. I think the studied one is the one who probably acted at Gorgia, right? Um, and it would have been a very pivotal moment, but it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't mark a departure in his character, right? And I'm going to take a step forward here and Cut me off if you need to, and do it with some force. <laughs> What's happening in the movie of Alexander of Alexander's life is you see this sort of very nice, neat, polished boy, right? He didn't really get drunk too much as he drank. He didn't really drink too much. He didn't do anything in excess. He was very much a restrained young man, brilliant in battle. His mother loved him, blah, blah, blah. And you start seeing little by little these signs. He's starting to deteriorate. He's becoming more paranoid. He's becoming uh, uh, more megalomaniac. Like he, he really started to believe that maybe, in fact, he is divine, right? Um, Gorgium would not be a good place for that either because it's too early, mm -hmm. right? And so to include that scene as part of his character arc would, would, would it would cinematically be great, but to include it as part of his character arc, I think, would be problematic because it happens way too early. Um, but it could be used to showcase his pragmatic size, how, 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 well put together he was. Now there's another scene afterwards, and this is back after Isis, um, and he goes through Phoenicia, which is the modern day modern day Palestine, Israel, Lebanon, all that, into Egypt, which I think that could cut both ways. And again, this is another scene that's off the battlefield, and he goes visits he goes to visit the Siwa Oasis. This is where the Temple of Amon was. And, and and the people back then would equate gods with one another. So the Greeks had their gods, and the the, the the Egyptians had theirs. And sort of in the Greek mind, Ammon was Zeus. They were equivalent gods. With the, you know, and so when um, Alexander takes Egypt, and he does it fairly fairly bloodlessly, when he does, he marches out to this oasis, the Siwa Oasis, S I W A, I believe, and he marches out there. And basically, he goes there and he's affirmed as a son of Zeus by the uh, oracle, by the priest there. 
the high and, priest of uh, who was in charge of Egypt at the time. It was him at that point. <laughs> Oh no! Oh, this, oh, this, this is post. Uh, I guess it was more of a, li li a liberation, right, of Egypt as they saw it. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Exactly. Um, and, and and so he, yeah, and so he was affirmed as. But even this particular thing, uh, on a number of levels, could be could, could be seen as being a very pragmatic diplomatic thing, something that he needed to legitimize his rule. So the same way, untying the gorge and not would have legitimized his rule. In, in modern day Turkey, being declared the son of Ammon would legitimate his rule in, in Egypt, right? It could also confirm his megalomania because now his mother's telling him, you know, you are the son of Zeus. You are this, you are that. And now he goes to this place and is like, yep, you are in fact the son of Zeus. I have a hotline to God and I'm telling you, he is. You are, right? Um, it could be one of those moments too, but it's also a very pragmatic thing. There's also other things behind that. Um, uh, and let me know if I'm going too far off the rails with this one. Um, but there's another reason why he would have undertaken this 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 this, this trip to the Sea Oasis. Um, when the Persians first conquered um, Egypt, the king then was named Cambyses, and he wanted to find the Sea Oasis, and and you know, and so he he put together an army of fifty thousand men. Who marched into the desert? They got lost, and they died to the man, never reaching the oasis. Right. So Alexander just took this province from for, from Persia by doing what Cambyses couldn't do. Right. He's further legitimizing his rule. I see. Right. There's also yeah. a third piece of the story that. That's a misunderstanding. And Aaron um, uh, um, um, uh, 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 mentions this: that that the the priest, being an Egyptian, wasn't very good at speaking Greek. Okay, <laughs> um, and he meant to say he meant to address Alexander as my son, but he didn't know how to do it properly in 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 Greek, so it ends up it ended up being translated as son of Zeus. So there's that other story. <laughs> Um, that it was all a big misunderstanding, right? And, and even if it were a misunderstanding, the fact that he's able to march out there where Cambyses had failed, at least on some degree, on some level, legitimizes his role. At least as a conqueror, if nothing else, right? But being declared the son of Zeus, sorry, in this case, really the son of Ammon, which is what the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh was, the son of God, right? He was now being called pharaoh so again one could possibly see this as a sign of megalomania or confirming his destiny um or as a pragmatic move and I, again i'm going to vote for the pragmatic so those two scenes were both left out but both could have been very powerful in setting the tone for alexander's char character up until the battle of Gagamela. okay um Was that a dog? Did I did I did I did I did I, uh, did I go a bit off topic there? Did I? Uh... Oh no no you're you're fine. I th do you have okay. a dog over? Do you have a dog no. over there? No no. Well, hold on a second. Oh, it's not my dog. Okay. <laughs> I no, thought it sounded. Not. Yeah. Um. So the uh. So now I'm I'm sorry I I'm, I got lost in the moment there. Uh. <laughs> let me refer back to my uh. If I'm boring you, let me know that too. Oh no, 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 you were fine. You, you, went, just... you went into you went into a lot of detail, and uh, okay. I was trying to uh, pick out a best way to segue into Aristotle. Um, oh, okay. Because basically, he kind of comes into the fold next as Alexander's tutor. Right. So we get so we get him, and uh, I mean this scene where it's obviously you know we have Christopher Plummer. And he's with Alexander, and I think Hephaestion's with them. Um, yep. And it's more of kind of that rearing of the children, right? That's kind of like you alluded to, you know, showing Alexander as a boy kind of going through his evolution into the man that he would become, right? Um, yep. Aristotle kind of dropping facts about Persia and their influence over the world and how that kind of sits with Alexander. It sits with him in a, in a way where it's like, 
why can't we defeat the Persians? Why do they need to own this quote unquote percentage of the world? And, uh, and there's a lot of, um, I, I, I wouldn't say nationalism is kind of the, the theme here in the scene. It's more, um, Greek superiority being trumped up yeah. in the scene, you know, Oh, well, we're, we're, we're destined, you know, we haven't done it, but we're supposed to do it. And, uh, because we're better than them and we're more civilized and more cultured and all that. Um, was Aristotle known for being a, <laughs> a guy with an inflated head? I mean, could you see him? He was known for being a spectacular bigot when it came to, came to Asiatics. Yes. He considered them to be slaves essentially by nature. Okay. But, but there's a few things I want to point out that this idea of nationalism, you can say it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a modern idea in a sense it is. But once, if you feel, if, we, if you're part of an in-group and, and Aristotle was Greek um, and he was, you know, to feel that you're superior to those who are not like you is pretty normal. I imagine the Persians felt the same way about the Greeks. And in fact, they, they, they did. Um, so, so that, you know, that Aristotle, you know, was, as I just described him as being, you know, notoriously bigoted or prejudiced. Well, he would he wouldn't have been the only one and he wouldn't have been the only man of intellect who felt that way about different people right that's the first thing the second thing you have to consider is that you know as far as the greeks are concerned they suffered at the hands of persians there were two attempted invasions of their country right or of okay. of, of their of their cultural um uh, zone right of their region um in one of them athens gets burned to the ground right and this mm -hmm. is despite the, the this is despite the heroic stand at Thermopylae. It was the second invasion, yeah. And and I believe it's the second invasion. Hold on, me, this I want to look this up because I don't want to get this wrong. You you already held court against me once. <laughs> uh, Persians burn Athens. I believe it's the second invasion under Xerxes. A, a communion. Okay, hold on. Uh, it was Xerxes, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and and so you know. It's not that the it's not that the Greeks didn't have a grudge against the Persians or didn't have the grounds for one. They did. So if Aristotle felt that way, he may have had reasons other than just naked bigotry, right? To yeah. feel this way. What I do find curious though is Alexander's statement of why can't we beat them? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's that 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 intrigue, right? That curiosity is as to why why and they limited. Why. But but here's why. By the time by the time period we're talking about, so we're talking about 300 BC. Uh, the invasion by Xerxes was about 480 BC. So we're talking about over a hundred years, or at least a hundred years, right? Difference. This happened a century before, two generations, three generations prior. Um, in that time, Greek mercenaries figured very heavily in Persian armies. And it's something which is not shown at Gagamela, which I was really, really, this is one of those things I wanted to complain about, about Gagamela. But it, at, at Granicus, at Isis, at Gagamela, even afterwards, for some period, Greek mercenaries figured into Persian armies. Um, everyone knew how good the Greeks were at fighting including the Greeks themselves, because they would go to Persia or a, a particular Persian satrap and hire their services out to them. So mm -hmm. I don't think that there, it, it was, it, it was you know, why can't we beat them? You know, when Alexander says that, it's not, it's not in, in the sense of, you know, why, why are we not as tough as they are? Because they knew that they were tough. They were tough as they were. Yeah. You know, you know what, what struck me as an intriguing was, what did he mean by that? And I think this is where I think, you know, um, it gets a bit tricky because he's just a boy. This, these are words in the mouth, in the mouth of a boy. Um, I don't know that he would have felt that way. I think, you know, were Macedonians Greek, would he, would he have felt that Greek um, uh, 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 burdens were his burdens, the Macedonian? Or would he think that as sort of um, a hegemon, as a Macedonian hegemon, that it was sort of a, a, a nicety, a, a mercy to pick up Greek burdens, right? Mm -hmm. And go into Persia, right? There, 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 there's a bunch of things going on here. Like, what did he mean? Because he couldn't have been a, a sense of military inferiority. Yeah. Right. Um, 
And then, and then to bear in mind the fact that he was he was Macedonian, which at the time, well, even today, I, to to some extent, they're not they're not synonymous. They're they're very close. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that there were not very very um, close context, uh, similarities, overlaps between Greek civilization and and and, and Macedonia. But I'll give you an example. I think it was Philodus, and this again, I'm, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. But this is when they're in Bactria, and and, I'll bring, uh, and if you take notes, please take a note and remind me of this when this comes up in its proper moment. Oh, oh, but so, uh, if you're, which, oh no, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just saying, if we, before we get into Bactria, um, anything. No, no, just Bactria. one little thing. I'm not going to get into Bactria very much. I'm just going to mention Phil Philotus, where there's a point where he has to defend himself, but he was raised speaking Greek. He was Macedonian by birth, but he, his Greek was better than his Macedonian, mm -hmm. and he chose to defend himself in Greek. Uh, against some charges that were levied against them, and not in Macedonian. So there were differences, and fairly stark differences. You know, it's not like if if I go to England, I can't. I, 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 I and if I'm on trial in England, I have to tell the judge, "Listen, I'm going to defend myself in American English, not British English. English <laughs> yeah. will do, right?" Yeah. But the, 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 he, he, Philod and I believe it was Philodus. Now the details here, I, I definitely might flub, and, and and but I know that this line is there. I think it was in Plutarch. Uh, I'm going on a limb here. I'll admit that much. But it was that his Macedonian wasn't good, so he decided to speak in Greek. They were different enough, is my point. So yeah. Okay. So there was there was some uh, cultural delineation. That's what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. That's fair. Um, I I'm I'm still going to sub subscribe that they were close enough that that's where the a bridge, not say a bridge. That's where the the bridge point, the the, uh, the connecting point was to kind of carry out this vast campaign of uh, Hellenic expansion. Um, and this is well, why, like, they that's why the the foregoing the complexities of Macedonian versus general Greek culture took a back seat for the sake of spreading Hellenism. Can you agree with that? No, no. I'm not no. that you know, so so here's the thing: we're looking at it from modern eyes, mm -hmm. and I know that for, you know your your background is you 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 have a Greek background, and, and yeah. I'm not saying this necessarily to challenge that or to, to to make a modern argument about whether Macedonia is Greek or not. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to say is the the geopolitical reality at the time. So you got to consider a couple of things. So remember, in previously I've mentioned the Gorge and Knot, and mm -hmm. the Sea Oasis. And how those two acts would have cemented um, Alexander's legitimacy to rule over those areas, right? Um, by taking on the mantle of, of, of revenge against Persia for what they did, um, it was it, it would be one form of legitimizing Macedonian rule over Greece. So it could have been a tool being used. That's the first argument that I would like to make. The second one is this: Philip was a rising power. He had a very, he had hit upon a very, very unbeatable military machine. One that lasted up until the late Roman Republic and was really only soundly defeated then by a Roman legion, which was vastly different in organization from, 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 from the, from the uh, Macedonian uh, infantry. So this, he hit upon a, a very, very formidable uh, and durable uh, a way of making war with the Macedonian phalanx and the cavalry and these light, light skirmishers, right? Um, it, it would have been very natural for a ruler in his position to want to conquer other territory. And, and this grievance of the Greeks would serve a double double purpose for him. It would allow him, A, the currency to, 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 to unite the Greeks and accept his rule, to accept even men from these cities in his army to fight with him, Right. Mm -hmm. Once he gets across the Bosphorus and into Anatolia, all of these Greek-speaking cities on, on the on that on that western coast would have readily accepted him, or in theory anyway, when he starts beating the Persians. Right. So there there, there are there, there's sort of this propaganda reason for pushing this narrative. It's why that a boy like young Alexander would have been too curious about this. Or taking Aristotle too seriously, um, but there's also this natural thing that this is what a king in his position would do anyway. You know, uh, to you know, to take the Romans, it was very natural for Caesar to go into Gaul. Why shouldn't he? 
is really the question we should be asking. And why wouldn't um, uh, uh, Philip want to plan an invasion of Persia and his son take it up? What else were they to do, right? Um, they had the propaganda in place to do it. So I'll leave it at that as my counter. Okay. Um, so uh, before I jump into, because I think we touched on, because we, we followed Aristotle's mm -hmm. lecture to Alexander and his and his fellow pupils, uh, we jump into this the scene with Bucephalus. Again, we already kind of touched on that um, before. Uh, I, I will say that the the score for that scene was probably one of the most beautiful pieces of music I've ever heard in a movie when he was taming Bucephalus. So that was kind of like, again, that's where Stone works kind of his magic into the movie where it is, uh, it is an amazing feat, but he makes it even more grand if that makes any sense because of the music and that that's that that'll be another uh sticking point for me as we kind of progress through the film itself but um okay i, I just I, like, I just that. like i just like the music there that's what that's all i wanted to throw out i, but I agree with you i agree with you. i think the music in general is pretty pretty good for this movie but that was definitely an outstanding piece yeah i agree with you 110 um i'm gonna cut to a short break um few messages from our sponsors don't really have any sponsors i'll put some stuff in there um and we're gonna jump into uh babylon 331 bc sound good sounds like a plan sounds good. okay all right so let's uh we'll pause here and folks we will be right back The following messages are courtesy of the Foundation for a Better Life at PassItOn.com. He was just a teenager when his father died in a robbery. He laid awake one night and imagined a place where good would always defeat evil, every wrong made right. He imagined a world of truth, justice, and the American way. Through his loss, Jerry Siegel imagined a new hero. His imagination created Superman. Imagination. Pass it on. From PassItOn.com. They were outnumbered. Ready. Out-equipped. They had no chance of winning. Fire. But they had one huge advantage. General George Washington. The fate of unborn millions will now depend, under God, on the courage and conduct of this army. We have to resolve to conquer or die. Just as the leadership of one man helped form a nation, today leadership can transform the world. Leadership is in you. Now pass it on from PassItOn.com. All right, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. And uh, we left off talking about, uh, well, actually, it was more so you uh, making very clear Macedonians and Greeks. Uh, <laughs> don't well, come at least my point of view. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, we're going to jump into Babylon, 331 BC. Um, and we're introduced to the harems, splendor, riches, all that jazz. Uh, in terms of authenticity, what what do you think of the scene? Um, was this fairly common for the folks who aren't uh, that knowledgeable about Babylonian culture at the time? Were were they big on harems and splendor and riches when you <laughs> when you conquered well, your foe? I think I think there's a couple of things. Um, uh, the first thing is the, the 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 costuming and the design throughout. This includes Gagamela, oh, particularly sort of these Eastern. Um, groups is actually very superb. Like the the beards, the the colors, the uniforms, the, the weaponry, and then when you get into Babylon, what the people were wearing, the general, you know, it, it, it all seemed pretty believable. And in some cases, it was pretty much what you you could find, like in a you know in a stone relief or something like that. In some cases, right? Yeah. Um, so I think the presentation was probably pretty good. Um, accuracy, let's not push it too far. In this case, I think it was enough to be to be credible, right? 
Okay. That, that was pretty good. Um, yes, they did have harems. Um, and, 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 and Darius the third definitely did. His father definitely did, and et cetera, et cetera. It was, you know, considered, a, 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 you know, something that, that the king did. But my understanding of harems wasn't quite what I think the modern imagination is. It's not this sexual playground for the ruler. Mm -hmm. um, it was actually a very, very sort of um, well-managed affair. <laughs> you know, you definitely had guards keeping out other males, and the guards tended to be eunuchs. Um, for those that don't, don't know who eunuchs are, um, they're men who've been castrated, essentially. Yeah, yeah. yeah right? And they are the ones who are going to be guarding the women in the harem. But it wasn't quite this sexual free for all. You know, there was there was a certain degree of, shall we say, civility um, surrounding it. Um, you know, it wasn't like you know Darius or anyone succeeding Darius would would go in there and have orgies and you know any his deepest pleasures satisfied. This was sort of approached as a very very serious administrative ta uh, uh, task in many cases. Um, now I don't know whether that's the case specifically in in, in the Achaemenid um, Persian dynasty, but for example, I have read like for example the Ottoman dynasty very much was so like that and in certain Chinese dynasties as well. Um, like for example, records will be kept, okay, when is a woman, in, in, you know, when is she um, menstruating, right? Because then she couldn't bear you a son or a daughter, right? And things like that. Um, oftentimes the women of the harem could bear potential heirs to the thrones. In some cases they couldn't. You, know, you had a royal wife for that. Uh, so, but it wasn't sort of this, this, it wasn't sort of that. Now with that said, if I were a con part of a conquering army, and that army happened to be Macedonian, um, you know, at the time, sort of um, sexual rights um, of the vanquished were very low. You probably could walk in there and do whatever the heck you wanted to, damn their rank. Mm -hmm. So um, after Isis, this is actually when um, Alexander captures uh, Darius's daughter, Styteria. It wasn't at Babylon in the harem where he meets her. And at that point, they were very credibly scared of what was going to happen to them. Would they be sold into slavery? And slavery definitely, especially for women, meant sexual humiliation. Um, now, Alexander treated them very admirably. And this is another feature of his personality. And this is sort of where this idea that he may have been a little bit um, not straight at the very least, just straight homosexual sort of starts. Yeah. So let's okay. so let's let's, yeah. let's 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 kind of dive into that because this is kind of our first introduction to Alexander's uh, sexuality. Because um, as you kind of alluded to there, yeah. uh, the harem of those times is going to be much different in terms of the structural function of what we think of as a harem in pop culture, right? It's like a free for all. Uh, as you were explaining, just like. Uh, guardship and just people kind of over watching over things being things don't things don't get too out of hand i was thinking it's kind of like java's palace a little bit i mean there's oh, yeah. <laughs> there's a, yeah. it's it's like there's some there's some sexual proclivity but it's not like a an, uh, an orgy uh mm -hmm. going on non-stop or or people just kind of indulging wholesale it's kind of more of a structured uh royal uh i wouldn't say romantic but a, an intimate meet and greet with yeah. subjects and 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 their and their masters or so on and so forth but I, I think it was interesting that he played around with the dichotomy of alexander's attraction right because he sees the allure of the women dancing uh and then, then he's subtly hiding or not hiding his interest in the eunuchs um no see i i, I don't I, I yeah good i'll let you i, I kind of want we're going to go in this one good one with you I, I mean, for me, um, I never, I, you know, reading, you know, it's just sometimes it, it depends on what text you read, who's doing what biography on Alexander at what time. But the, the scholarly debate over his sexuality, whether he was uh, strictly heterosexual and it was more of rumors sprinkled into the history about his sexuality when he was more legitimately just bisexual or and he just he had no qualms about being with either men or women or he was strictly gay and then he only married women like roxana and other and some of his other wives just to keep up 
uh, I, I wouldn't be so, so much concerned about appearances, but to maintain those royal connections and to keep uh, alliances strong. Um, as many people did back in the day, you know, they'd marry for the benefit of both countries or both nations, what have you. Um, I, I, I think this, I, I, I'm kind of okay. I'm, I'm more leaning towards the middle ground where it's like he was probably engaging in some form of sexual activity with both men and women um, based off of what most scholars seem to agree on is the textual references to him having relationships with different people. But the thing is, I also have to keep in mind that they contextualize the sort of relationships that were normal back then and the sort of verbiage that people used where um, the meaning of one word today is going to be much different back then, you know, over to what, 2,000, uh, 700 years ago. Um, so I, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that concerning, you know, is, I guess it's an introduction. It's later on, they'll kind of get into it more with um, the eunuch that he has in his, I wouldn't say his employee, but he becomes his, his servant, like his, his personal servant. Um, mm -hmm. And his ambiguous relationship with Hephaestion. Um, yeah, that's the, see, yeah. So, so let, 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 let's start with, um, you know, Alexander's sort of sexual proclivity. What, 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 where does he go, right? Where does he swim? Um, so, you know, this, this, you know, he walks in this harem and we had this preconceived notion of a harem, what it is, and it's not. Chances are, you know, these women sort of being a little bit nervous when these men in armor come, you know, walking in and where men aren't allowed, but these are foreign men and they're grimy and dirty, possibly bloody from battle or whatever it might be. But, you know, but they're not going to immediately start saying, oh, okay, I mean, the coast is clear. Now I can, I can get down to the business of overtly sexually gratifying these men. That's not what they were going to do. Yeah, under any circumstance, this is the normal reaction, right? To use this as sort of this 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 litmus test of, of, of Alexander's heterosexuality probably is the worst um, sort of test you can employ. A, a part of the reason is going back to um, you know when when um, his army captures uh, 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 Darius's family, his mother and his daughters, uh, sorry, his his wife and his daughters um, after Isis. Their fear was Craig, but they're going to get raped, essentially, just, just to get rid of all euphemisms. Um, but he treated them very honorably, that he made sure that no one touched them. Alexander had a habit of doing this. Okay, so and again, in, in the sources, his his um his his temperament is very much restrained, it's very calculated. He, he, he has very much control over his base desires, right? Um, I mentioned the battlefield before, but also in, in matters of statecraft. He does show a great deal of discretion. Here's another point where he does, I believe, show discretion. This isn't really necessarily a, uh, a you know, some indication of his proclivity as much as, okay, you know what? We have to rule these people. And I'm not going to make a mess of things just yet. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and I think this, but, you know, eventually I'm sure the men would be interested. He'd have to sort of relent a little bit. But what he didn't want was a free-for-all that, that, again, the Indian army usually indulged in. In that time, yeah, and that that's kind of uh, that's, that, that's a and good segue. Example, yeah. It's yeah. a good segue into how he's very quick to integrate uh, Persian before values. We get to that, but before oh, we get no, to that, oh, the, oh, the, the issue of the Gullahs, right? Now, it's actually in my mind, it's actually very clear that Bagoas, in fact, was involved with Alexander, and that that involvement did involve sex. They include sex, rather. Wait, wait, is that, I, is that the, the eunuch? Yeah, the unit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, okay. The, okay. The, the, yeah. No, no, no. Bogolus was actually the counselor of Darius before he passed on to Alexander. Um, and Greeks were very much worried out by eunuchs, but for some reason, the Macedonians and the Greeks seemed to be okay with Bogolus. And I'm, it's not clear why, but they seemed to be okay with this relationship. Um, yeah. and, and, and the sticking point isn't that, that it was a homosexual relationship, the sticking point would have been that he was a eunuch. Now, when we talk about bisexuality, Alexander's father was bisexual. He had both male and female lovers. Yeah. He was a man of tremendous sexual appetite. Um, so, so the idea of, 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 you know, a man taking on a younger, and, and, and the thing is younger, it was always, there's always an age directionality. 
lover was perfectly normal. I don't think anyone would have thought twice about it. Alexander, there was never a matter of Alexander hiding sexual or needing to hide sexuality. Um, you know, the, the sort of, as I understand, the sort of life cycle was okay, you know, you're a little boy, you grow up, you get a little bit older, and then you start playing around with it. And eventually, most guys ended up marrying women and being in strictly heterosexual relationships. And some continued. Yeah. Strictly one way. Some people say, okay, I'm going to dabble with both. I'm going to get married and have kids because maybe I want kids. Or maybe I like having sex with my wife too. You know, it could be a number of things. But there was sort of the spectrum of what people did. And, and, and this idea that, you know, Alexander would have married, say, for example, Roxana to hide something. There was nothing he would need to hide. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, yeah. So this is, yeah, this is where I, uh, that's where I meet you. And I agree. It's, uh, it was a sexuality at this time in human history or civilized history anyway it was saying it's a stone's throw away from the way we approach it today is just, it's an understatement it was it was much different much more i wouldn't say um see even even the word acceptance is is yeah. kind of it's taken on a new meaning in the postmodern era it's kind of the it's just the way things were it is what it is so right. let's let's let, let's move on yeah. from Magos. Let's, let's move on from the harem. Let's because uh, we do get Olympias back in the picture again. Um, we already touched on these uh, incestuous subtleties of the relationship. Um, you touch. I loved how you touched on the occultist aspect of her character and her role, the spiritual advisor, and and so on. Um, again, this is where the movie starts doing that juxtaposition of floating back and forth between time frames and and moments. Um, and this is where, for me, again, I'll kind of, I'll, I'll surmise it later, but uh, it could have been done much better in different type of, type of media format anyway. Um, we, we go into northeastern Persia. And this is where it gets fun. We're chasing Darius. Darius is on the run. Exiled mm -hmm. King Darius. He, he dies, right? He, he, dies. Gets, assass he gets assassinated. He gets assa yeah. And, um. And this is pretty true to form. This is, I, I remember reading, this is exact, this is, well, I'll, not exactly how it happened, but this is, he was running for the hills. He was kind of killed by his own um, before Alexander got to him. Do you think they did a good job showing that? Um, in, in a sense, he, he was found dead in the ditch. That's all it was. Um, in the final cut, they definitely flesh out Darius a bit more. Did they not? They did they did, not show they, some of that in the ultimate cut? No, in the ultimate cut, they did. In the theatrical cut, the very first version, they didn't really go into much. He didn't have much dialogue. He had more dialogue in the ultimate cut, actually. Yeah, um, yeah, he, yeah, he becomes like a. I won't say a stock presence, but he's just kind of there. He, he has more to do. Yeah, he's just not yeah. like in the theatrical cut. Basically, you see him standing in a chariot, giving orders. Yeah. Yeah. You, and yeah. that's all he I, does. I, you know. With these very yeah. weird, and I will call them out on that, very weird standing close-ups that we didn't need for as long as we did. And these hand gestures, like he's trying to like land a plane or something. It's, it's, yeah, it's, <laughs> that was, that's Oliver Stone being super dramatic. And I don't, and again, that's, that's a theater aspect of it, like that Shakespearean level of uh, exaggeration. I don't know, but. Uh, it, it was it, it might work in a stage, but it's a bit ridiculous because you have to understand the vastness of his army. I, I know it's been overstated in the past, but let me just pull this up here. I want to. I, I did. I, I neglected to do this before. I hinted at it, but I want to see like how big the respective armies were. I want to give sort of more precise numbers because Darius is simply giving hand hand gestures, right? So we're talking about an army that could have been a Thais estimate one hundred twenty thousand men. <laughs> Wow, so, wow. <laughs> that Lord he's sitting there giving these hand gestures. You know, and like, the guy, the guy all the way in the back is like, <laughs> yeah. are we doing anything? What's going on? Are we moving? I what can't are we see. doing? <laughs> so it's it's it's, I mean, it's a bit I would ridiculous. understand if he did like the light the light the like like the the light not the lanterns, what were those uh things that the did in the return of the king where they light the towers and it goes from oh, one yeah. tower to another. They could have done that with like a guy yes. just put him up on a chariot, just have him waving torches to the other guy further down. Yeah, oh, they could, yeah. we could have done something like that. Yeah. But it was it, so but in the ultimate cut he has a bit more dialogue. I mean 
his death is just sort of like he's dead in the ditch. I thought that, okay, they may have, you know, okay, they could have done more developed Darius's character, but they didn't. Yeah. Okay, fine. Having him in a ditch, I think kind of, it may have been to sort of just show how low he'd fallen since Scott Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, it's, I think it's more, he did it more for the poetic representation of this is how Persia fell. They were, this is how big they were. And now look at where they ended up in a ditch. <laughs> this is this is the this is the concluding point for the Persian uh, Empire. This is how they go out uh, with their their most. I I would say the most. Uh, I I mean, you bring up anybody in terms of antiquity related to Persia. Darius is always. I think maybe Xerxes could be second, but um, well, well, they say Darius is Jesus' father. Xerxes' father. Darius the first, Dur right? Yeah, it's Darius the yeah, first, yeah. who's really, uh, by 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 many accounts, um, and, and I think I, I I wouldn't be able to say this, one of the greatest emperors of an empire in history. He was he was a fascinating and very able man. Even uh, better than even better than Cyrus. Oh well, that's a hard one to say. Cyrus, we know so little about Cyrus, but what we do know is that he accomplished sort of what Alexander did in the reverse direction. Oh, so okay. <laughs> it's hard to say that, you know, but I think, I think in a sense, in a sense, he may actually have been better than, better than, um, better than, uh, 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 uh Cyrus in, in, in this sense. D Darius the first. Yeah. Darius the first one, okay. better, better than Cyrus and Alexander in the sense that it's one thing to conquer an empire. It's very different to hold it together. And, and Darius the first did a, he did this stupendous job of holding it together but, you know he, he gets defeated at marathon but you know modern day Thra uh, thrace mm -hmm. which is sort of that right across from north uh, western turkey that part of greece it was well, actually part of turkey but also macedonia that's part of northern greece now and that's independent you know that was all under persian control for some time um Phil not not philip when philip was a boy I think I think it was one Philip, but definitely if not Philip's father, then his grandfather were um under Persian influence. So so Darius, um I, I think in a lot of ways he held the empire together and just expanded it just a touch into um you know westward. But then there's also what he made done eastward as well. Um I believe he did fight said uh, uh step nomads. Uh, don't quote me on this. Uh, I think he, in fact, did uh, rather successfully, if I'm not mistaken. So, in a lot of ways, he did a double. He did double duty. He held together an empire and expanded its borders. Um, Alexander simply founded an empire. Alexander and Cyrus are equivalent in that respect, right? Yeah. So, you know, I personally would would say the administrator is always better, <laughs> but that's just my opinion. So, yeah. So we we leave. Darius the third on the battlefield dead. We move into Bactria, and this is where Alexander marries Roxana, right? Yeah. And I saw her as because she was like I I I put her I, I in some of my note taking I put her down as a working class woman, but she wasn't really. I mean, see again, I'm 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 juxtapositioning the type of class structure that she would have come from today back aligned with them back then um but she was just really the the daughter of like a merchant or an average merchant or tradesman no 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 no, no. she was the daughter of a local aristocrat oh so local, she I'm was sorry. In a sense royalty yeah but but, but she but, was but but they they played her office she was very just unremarkable though i don't know why they did that so that's why i kept she thinking it would have been though for for a man who just conquered the known world this okay. is a level okay. marrying marrying Stytera, or Darius's wife, or something like that, or a proper Macedonian, would have been on par with his accomplishment, his status, his newfound status. But sort of marrying this woman, yeah, she's aristocracy, but she's this far-flung province. You know, the bump, the the. It's, it's like you know, okay, uh, uh, you know, the 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 aristocrats of Arkansas. Oh, got it. Okay, got it. Got the aristocrats, but they're from Arkansas. I, is this really is this you know if you're if you're a big magnet from uh from new york city wall street guy is this is this really you know that's kind of thing yeah because 
yeah it makes it makes sense so it makes sense so now but i mean so this is why the the pushback that comes from his marriage to roxana from the companions right parmenion he's fear well he's so i don't so know if there I, was actually pushback on this particular subject well no not the marriage the, the assimilation of the, uh, the that history. yeah his, yeah his, so to me, to, to me the marriage was more about securing a very vulnerable border and it's actually a very smart thing to do and in the movie he said i can have other wives and he's actually true about that he's very much behaving like his father philip yeah. in this sense right but now you want to move on to okay so he he sort of takes on a foreign wife but then he's taking on other trappings of foreign so that's yeah that's that's what i'm referring to yeah so parmenion's kind of like that that first distinct voice kind of rising up and saying hey you know you're a little too overzealous uh running this new consortium with your former enemies and and just bringing them into the fold as as not not only subjects but equals seeing it, you're showering them with uh praise that they don't deserve as a not vanquished but a conquered enemy yeah. Yeah. um and and this is where it's like i i would i kind of looking into some research and you know historians the way they kind of uh uh, one historian wrote, and I don't remember his name, but I, I have jawed down. He said that Alexander was the first multicultural leader. Um, and it, it was, I don't, I don't know in terms of him bringing in a diverse form of government. I don't know why. I mean, he he said some other stuff that I, I don't necessarily agree with, but he said that the way Alexander approached rulership was that instead of vilifying your foes for the stuff that you disagreed with them on you brought them in to continually strengthen the empire to make it stronger based off of these different cultures working together um it's a very general statement uh i think it was much more complex because he had to hold the empire together from one end to the other mm -hmm. and he had to maintain these relationships for the sake of keeping things steady mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't know what are your thoughts on that. Do you think that Alexander, I mean, because when we think of like democracy today, I mean, he obviously wasn't a democracy, but they said that he, op he there was an operative level of democracy in terms of the way he listened to people that he shouldn't be even listening to as a, as a conqueror. Other than tax policy, my feeling is that the way he ruled was very much the way the Persians ruled if he was a multicultural emperor so was cyrus the great mm -hmm. for the most part so for example going back to galgamela the army that confronted um Darius, uh, uh, alexander was not only larger um estimates range from 50,000 to uh, 120,000 the macedonians were about 47,000 so his force could have been marginally larger or much larger and i i would go with the higher figure in this case just because the descriptions of you know the movements of the battle just mean that that you know 3000 men difference was not is not going to make this you know so you know this is a very now it's a larger army but it's also a very multicultural army you had people from nubia in this army that was facing the macedonians um what's what was glossed over in the movie you had Indians on elephants in that movie. Yeah. In, in that battle. So you actually had so you actually had first contact with elephants at Gagomela, and they were manned by Indians. Um, you actually had Indian cavalry there, you had Central Asian cavalry. So um, you know, um, you mentioned Babylon uh, earlier, and what's the significance of Babylon? Babylon was an administrative center. Cyrus couldn't have controlled the empire without being able to control Babylon and 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 co-opting the elite at Babylon to do his bidding, because they had the know-how of how to administer, you know, censuses, collecting tax information, transact uh, business transactions, all these little things. And that's why I, I always, I think Darius the first is the better <laughs> of, uh, uh, emperor of, of the ones we've been discussing thus far. But all these little things um, Cyrus needed as well as Alexander did. He sort of accomplished them in very similar ways. Now there were certain differences um, and this is more towards the end. So a lot of these things, um were starting to happen so i think the big things when he was in bactria that were happening were sort of um uh definitely bringing in uh native sort of persian aristocracy 
right? Um, integrating some of them into the army. And I use the word integrating here very loosely, much more loosely than what's depicted in the movie uh, as part of integration. The other thing was integration of sort of um, administration that included how you approached the new king. Uh, the Greeks, the Macedonians being related cultures had very different views of how to approach a king versus the Persians. And one of these things was prostration. You know, getting on the ground, bowing and kneeling in front of a monarch was something that Greeks didn't do. That was that was something that was a level of respect reserved for the gods. It was something mm -hmm. done in the temple, not in the palace. But Alexander was allowing it. And the gripe was that he was not just allowing it for Persians to do it, but there started to become points where he was, he, he wouldn't say no if a Macedonian followed it. So it was encouraging Macedonians and Greeks to sort of take on Persian culture, dress in Persian robes. So this is sort of the, this is, it's, it, it's, he's, he, he's, he's getting more up close and personal where Cyrus it seems like he really wasn't willing to take on Babylonian ways. He was a Persian and he was going to stay Persian, right? The fear was that, you know, Alexander was becoming less Macedonian. And, and so I think the first layer is he's introducing customs which are shocking to Macedonians. How you don't prostrate yourself in front of a mortal man. And then the second thing was taking on Persian clothing. Yeah. And this was something and encouraging others to do it. And I think then the third straw was including the aristocracy. But I think including the aristocracy was probably the least of, of, of his sins. The bigger sin would have been including units in the military, something which something which um, Macedonians were probably very unaccustomed to. Um, and they would have seen that as a bit more of a threat than, say, the Persians would have. Because they would have served with mixed units. They would have been used to serving with mixed units. They would have been used to serving for genera for at least a generation, if not more, uh, serving with Greek units, right? So, yeah, so, yeah, so that's sort of my take on what the dispute was. What Because, again, a lot of this made administrative sense. And, and Cyrus would have done the exact same thing in his shoes. But there would have been a limit to how far Cyrus got. So I think in the sense that was he multicultural emperor? Um, in some respects, he was, but it's his his willingness to take on the trappings of, of of the conquered people, right? Yeah. And I'm talking specifically about the clothing. Yeah. You know, which just and like then, now uh, is a statement. You know, you wear the clothing of another culture. You embrace their customs or their traditions. You you look like you are trying to be one of them, for better or for worse. Uh, for whatever reason. It's more than that, though. I think he's trying to, again, um, going back to the course of not in the sea or oasis, right? It's also this idea that he needs to legitimize himself. And with Greece, it's easy, because they have, there's more cultural commonalities. He can say, I am the son of Heracles, son of Zeus. And they would say, okay, fair enough. The Greeks, the Greeks would say, fair enough, okay, cool. He crosses the Bosphorus, all the you know Greek-speaking city-states. Okay, cool. We have no problem with that. He goes further into Anatolia. Okay, he, he breaks the gorge and not. And now the Lydians and other groups will say, oh, okay, we, we can see why you had the right to rule over us, at least in the metaphorical, mythological sense. He goes to Siwa. Now he goes in the Persian Empire, there's much less cultural overlap. There's nothing that he can say that's going to legitimize his rule. Same as the Zeus, the Persians don't care. He cut the gorge and not why do they care? We Cyrus didn't cut the gorge and not he conquered all of Asia too. Why should we care that you did? Right? Yeah. yeah. Son of Ammon, you know, legitimate pharaoh of Egypt. Why do we care? We ruled Egypt for this. What is he going to tell the Persians to legitimize his rule? There's something he couldn't tell them. So by co-opting their nobility, right? This was how he legitimized his rule. He had no other option. I think it's a very pragmatic thing also. This is another layer to it. It, it, it isn't the first thing that I was saying, but I think he had to do a bit more because there was nothing he could do. Well, oh, and this is and, and this is where we start seeing the unfolding of the gradual unfolding of loyalty to Alexander's yeah. vision, right? So he has Armenia, he's assigned to stay in Babylon. He has Antipater. You're heading back to Macedonia. His um, Alexander is very firm 
on this is how my empire is going to run. Um, and he starts rubbing everyone the wrong way, even Hephaestion, right? Hephaestion's like, he's well, in fit. He's, Hephaestion and Piquestas was another one who I can't promise pronounce, but there were some who were okay with this. And Hephaestion was one of them. He was actually willing to dress in Persian robes and embrace Persian customs. So, so the 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 customs are but i'm not referring to it's the uh it's the idea of roxana <laughs> oh, so okay. so they start so stone I'm, I'm i'm just basing it off of what we're seeing in the movies stone is showing us that there's animosity on all ends with all things now you know where hephaestian's jealousy is starting to bubble to the top you have alexander roxana getting into the throes of things i walk in here and find everybody upset and and we don't and we don't get a lot going in terms of and this is where the movie kind of starts slogging for me, right? Because we have another time jump. We have Olympias warning. Well, she warns Alexander about going further east. He's talking to his mother. More Alexander Olympias moments, right? She's she's again being brought into the fold, which which I appreciated. It's just the the constant time jumps to her in terms of where we're breaking. For the sake of the story's progression continuity it's like it's a lot it's for folks who don't have a grasp of this kind of history involving alexander it's it, it's it's going to be confusing because mm -hmm. you have to remember this isn't this isn't an episodic series like stone expected people to sit in the theater and watch this unfold and the, and the you know, alexander revisited the final cut and then the ultimate cut that you watch added like so much footage you know with a whole bunch of extra dialogue and extra uh, cinematography and all this stuff it's like you really need to pay attention to keep track of what date you're in like there's i mean the, the time jump we got to persia I, I felt I, I felt that it was an improvement and the jumps don't bother me like the you know gagamel and then sort of how he developed kind of it's kind of cool to see him as apogee and how he got there and it seems like each of the jumps kind of do somehow correspond to the moment where he's at at that particular time and they kind of say, okay, here's where he is now, and here's kind of how he got here. Or here's the, the you see what I'm saying? I think the the jumps didn't bother me at all, quite frankly. So the the, the, the moment here where I felt like it was a little cluttered, right, is when they jumped to Sogdia 10 years later, right? You see the assassination attempt on Alexander. And then we jump into the conspiracy by Philotus. Mm -hmm. Parmenion's implicated. We have Clytus and the other companions. They ride off to execute Parmenion. And then we have Alexander and a servant. And then we get another time jump nine years earlier, and it's King Philip's moment. Yeah. And the wedding and the debauchery and all that. Following that, we get the Hindu Kush 10 years later. Mm -hmm. So the, it, is, it, it seems like here would have been a moment to just kind of take a breather, maybe focus on one of those three. And I mean, obviously, you don't want to draw each out too long, but... I feel like some of these moments here could have been sprinkled in earlier and we wouldn't have been the wiser or the uh, the more ignorant for it. You know, it's like we would have been like, okay, it's part of what's going on now. Like it's mo the moment with his father and the, the wedding and his mother and, and he's defending her honor. Um, we go from that to the Hindu Kush and he's marching <laughs> into the boundaries of India, you know? Yeah. And, and then we get the intermission. Yeah. Yeah. Don't it, get the intermission. It, it, it is a bit scattered, but maybe maybe I just I, I just accepted it. Again, I think the the later versions because there's more time, there's sort of more going into each of these scenes. Yeah, and either the present or the flashback, and it, it fleshes things out a bit better. Um, but I, you know, I, so let me put it this way: I think the rationale there, I can see why the 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 the, the, the they cut back to the specific times that they did, but I wouldn't have done it that way. I, I would agree with you. It does mess with the pacing. Now we're in India, right? And we start off with, with some, thankfully, some humor. Um, the monkey scene where <laughs> they show Alexander conquering the monkeys who they thought were tribesmen at first. I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty sure that Alexander knew what a monkey was. I'm sure most of his army knew what a monkey was. <laughs> I mean, because at that time, animals were being traded in in the ancient world back and forth, right? They were they were monkeys in Egypt. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the monkeys. I was like, monkeys. did he think he landed on the planet of the apes or something? I mean, what? Yeah. I was like, yeah. 
He's like, and they don't, and and Hephaestion had to explain what they were, and it was it was hilarious because it's like it's, it's something out of a sketch, um. But I was like, I don't really believe. Come on, I mean, the, the, they were animals were being traded at, as early as like what maybe the Minoans before then with the Sumerians, right? I mean, yeah, they were, yeah, yeah. Who knows? I, I don't know the particulars of monkey trade, but I think it's pretty fair to state to think that that they knew what monkeys were maybe not well, that I, particular even food even monkeys. food because even food because some of them ate monkeys i mean not as like as a slight they just they they, they, they would cook and eat monkeys so it's like yeah. somebody sees a yeah. dead monkey they're like oh my god did you just eat that person like come on <laughs> well it you was know something... it... yeah go ahead, go ahead sorry no it's just it was funny I, I enjoyed it but i'm like okay i don't believe this it was, it, it, I, 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 you know, I, I, I felt it was a bit of an insult. <laughs> it's like, and also, you get into the the territory of like, are you saying that? Are you comparing Indian people? Monkeys? No, 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 not, not so much that. But it was an insult to the intelligence of the Macedonians. Of course, they they knew what a monkey was. And if if, if an individual soldier didn't, then there's probably a commander or someone else who did know what a monkey was. But certainly, the whole army was going to get mobilized to fight baboons. In, in, in I mean. Jungle. I mean, I could. It's forget. a bit ridiculous. So, so the idea that maybe, if, maybe there, maybe there was maybe twenty percent who didn't know what a monkey was, but once you tell them, well, okay, yeah, okay, that's fine. But that, 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 yeah, the companies of men were being mobilized to go after these. It'd be very hard for me. I mean, maybe if they were like northern tribesmen, maybe further up into like the the echelons of the the upper uh, the steps of northern Europe or something, and they never traveled anywhere. <laughs> I could believe that, you know, but the Mediterranean, Asia Minor, Anatolia, this area where constant trade is happening, it's like people are trading. They're they're seeing camels, monkeys. I mean, ape. I mean, apes are probably floating around somehow. Elephants, but well, apes would be harder, but monkeys definitely would have been. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't, yeah, that's right. I, 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 I can see, I can see them employing gorillas in the Macedonian army. Yeah, that's gonna. Well, I'm going to do a quick Google search for monkeys in ancient Greece. Because here we go. Many many show paintings of monkeys, yet there were no monkeys in Greece at the time. Ah, so this is a Bronze Age. It's a New Scientist article. Ancient monkey paintings suggest Bronze Age Greeks. So they kind of they kind of had an idea of, of, of what monkeys were. But what was more ridiculous was at a certain point in the theatrical cut, and I think it's carried over in the, in the ultimate cut. I have the timestamp here. 147, one hour and 47 minutes into this movie, yeah. there is what appears to be a Neanderthal. Really? Yeah. In the in the foreground? It's sort of in the midground. It's not in the background, but it's not quite in the foreground. Yeah, there's something that looks like a Neanderthal. It's not just a very unkempt. <laughs> I think it could be, but it's like, dude, that looks way too unkempt. I and mean, given the part of the world it's in, yeah, it was very strange. In the in the uh, in the chat, I just left you the. Oh, one okay, yeah. Let me let me take a look. Stuff. At, yeah, let me take this a look. This is the monkey. Stuff. I'm gonna find the Neanderthal stuff. Hold on. <laughs> well, you know there is an, a, an again an actual an apocryphal uh, piece of history where they said that Alexander was reportedly seeing large human like or ape like humans when he was crossing over there. And they said that he actually had seen the Yeti. Um, that's something to kind of keep in mind. That there's uh, there's some also some I don't say paranormal, but some cryptozoological uh, <laughs> connection. Alexander and, and Bigfoot, or the Bigfoot of Asia, or something. Oh well, yeah. I mean, listen, the cryptozoology is one thing, but you got to figure out another thing. These guys were marching in the in the in in, in winter for for they're there for like months, years, right? So you're saying they're hallucinating? They could have seen all sorts of things. You know, I I I've always I've always considered, um, you know, sort of these sort of phenomena, you know, where ghosts or aliens or crypto, you know. A lot of these events occur under very similar circumstances. It involves it being dark and and some level of disorientation. So you, you, know, you, don't, you don't find any base well, you don't find any basis for any of it? 
for most of it, I'm just like, yeah, this is this is probably this didn't happen. And, and I'm thinking that 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 you know, like, if Alexander did in fact see the Yeti, um, he may have seen a bear or something. But because he was tired, or at this point, he's getting drunk a lot more often than he was before, or drunk. Yeah, which definitely could have been a thing for him. He could have been mentally impaired, or the nobility around him, his companions, definitely could have been in the state also. You know. Yeah. This, yeah. You know, unfamiliar territory also. So, you know, there's all these factors where they could see something and say, oh, that's weird, and it's really not. 